the river can say the nation. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my deepest gratitude for your invitation. Uh, John, thank you very much for inviting me. Dr. Paul, Dr. B, Kenneth, thank you very much for including me among the presenters of today. Uh, my work mainly revolves around educational technology and research. In 2016, UNESCO put forth a call for research proposals from higher educational institutions across the world. This is the Learning for All, the guidelines for the inclusion of learners with disability in open and distance learning. So what we did in the Philippines, we formed a team, and luckily we won the award. Yeah. So, hey. <laughs> so we finished the research and project last 2017, and uh, the rest called on us to go to Colombo to report on the findings. That is where I met your esteemed colleague, Dr. Fong and Joe Hironaka. And upon consultations during breakfast, we come up with projects in the Philippines and Malaysia, I think one in Latin America, to harness the power of technology, particularly that of open and educational resource, to make it more inclusive for learners, meaning to say learners across different varying disabilities. Uh, in the Philippines, we call it the OER UDL in HDI in PHL. <laughs> <laughs> Too many acronyms. Many educational, uh, open educational resource in universal design for learning in higher education institutions in the Philippines. Okay. Uh, <laughs> since yesterday, I've been learning a lot from my conversations with you from the simple day day that we're having. Dr. Paul pointed out that this is an inclusive OER because inclusive education would go beyond universal design for learning. And this, that is something that, that uh, I'm, I'm bringing back to the Philippines. Uh, we also designed our logo. This is the OER UDL. Now we will maybe make it I-E-O-D-O-E-R. This is the Philippine flag actually with different variants of colors which represent the different diversity of the groups in the Philippines, including those with very disabilities. So in the Philippines, uh, as reported, 97% of children, marginalized children, don't have, this is what I don't have access to education. Despite the fact that in most government in most countries around the world, education is free. This is also true uh, in my country for the basic education, the K-12. Uh, pocket. Pocket? Oh, okay. And uh, it's also It is also now the 112 or special education. When we talk of inclusive education, when we talk of universal design for learning, usually it would fall under the umbrella of special education. Also, uh, according to the Philippine statistics, 3% of PWDs, only 3% of PWDs are in the schools, in different levels of schools across the Philippines. I'm very glad to note that you have your own office that would around 500, more than 500,000 are not enrolled in the program. We don't have that statistics yet in the Philippines. And also, in the Department of, of Education, only 2% is in the K-12. In the Philippines, the Department of Education would take care of the K-12 and the Commission on Higher Education would take care of the higher education institutions. And, but we also have an RA. This is RA 10754. This is an expanded version of the rights and privileges of persons with disabilities. So say, for example, PWDs would have their own name. 20% uh, less on all products. May it be education, may it be medicine, may it be airfare, etc., etc. 
And in terms of the Philippines, so this is what uh, the Philippines has been doing in terms of inclusive education, in terms of people with disability. And as you know, the Philippines is also a digital Philippines. So in 2019, there are around 100 million, 107 million of us. But there is 124 million mobile subscribers. Can you imagine that? <laughs> because in the Philippines, a person could have one mobile with two SIMs, dual SIMs. Or a person would have one mobile, uh, one person would have three mobiles. <laughs> So we are the texting capital of the world. We're the fifth largest users of Facebook. We're into social media. And there are around 71% of inter internet users in the Philippines, especially concentrated in mega cities like Metro Manila, Cebu, Davao, etc., etc. And also 76% of those who, who have internet access are very, very active in social media. We have around 72% or around or 72 million or 67% with unique mobile subscribers. So as, as I mentioned, the Philippines is a very digital country. Unfortunately, uh, how will I say this? Unfortunately, <laughs> we have the slowest internet connection but the most expensive uh, in all of ASEAN. But I think the government now is working uh, to achieve what you have here. I noticed that the internet is very, very fast, etc., etc. So I think our government is looking. We recently had the Department of ICT, the Department of Information and Communication Technologies, who are now working in improving a little bit more of what Digital Philippines is doing. Okay. In terms of educational resources in the Philippines, uh, we have an act called the FOSS Act, the Free and Open Source Act, or Software System Act of the Philippines. It encourages, on the first hand, that all government institutions and organizations, including college states and universities, public, that are sponsored by the governments, be migrated into open source. So this has been done around five years ago or seven years ago. Unfortunately, it is not that successful. So still, um, a lot of our public schools like UP or state universities are still using proprietary softwares. But we do have a law that would entail them to use open source. It's a different thing when you have the law and, as Dr. Sita would say, and the teeth to, to implement it. Also, the Commission on Higher Education is offering a free website that would provide resources for K-12 and for higher education institutions. So it curated contents from different universities as well as from the Department of Education um, and put it on a website where everyone could get resources for teaching, for learning, and even for research. While the Department of Education would have its LRMDS. And LRMDS, again, is a portal designed for K-12 in the Philippines. So if you're teaching math in grade 1 or music in grade 6 or science in grade 12, you can go to the website, provided uh, you have your corresponding ID from DepEd, and you could get OER. This OER could be in a form of multimedia content. It could be in a form of a lesson plan, a daily log, etc., etc. And this is open, very, very open, in the sense that all the community members also upload their own created contents. But there is a certain level of QA, quality assurance. So once I upload it, if it's physics, it would be given to the physics bureau of the Department of Education and assess whether this content this material is really good. 
And if it is, then it will be thrown back to the website and made available for everyone. Also, some progressive universities, uh, De La Salle University, Ateneo University, University of the Philippines, etc., etc., and our UPOU, which is UP, University of the Philippines, offer univer open university, UPOU. They have their own portal for digital learning resource and OER. So this is also made available to the public. So if I'm from another university, I could go to these sites and download corresponding OERs. And there are also some government, non-government organizations and other corporations that put forth content in terms of OER and making it available to the public. So in terms of OER, the Philippines would have available resources but scattered initiatives in terms of uh, giving it to the public for public consumption. So before we started the, the workshop on OER UDL and also with the UNESCO project, we did some baseline research on how HEIs in the Philippines are uh, analyzing, implementing, developing, creating, or maintaining OER, inclusive education, and the universal design for learning. Okay. So in terms of ODL, including OER, most universities in the Philippines would have their e-learning systems. You do, all of you would have also that, whether you call it uh, uh, an office for teaching and learning, or an e-learning office, etc., etc. So it is the same in the Philippines. And also, most of our HEIs are into blended and hybrid learning. Right? I, I know also in Malaysia. So most of our universities would have their own guidelines and framework on how to go blended learning. Say for example, in De La Salle University, you cannot go as high as 50%. Okay? So there should be 50% face-to-face and another 50% online learning. And we have also uh, put in place framework on how to assess the online learning because one of, the, one of the challenges is it's open to abuse. Diba? Some professors would declare it as an online class, but they are not actually doing anything online. The professor don't, just don't want to come to class, etc., etc. <laughs> and it's the same. <laughs> also, uh, in terms of research, there is a wealth of research available for open and distance learning. Right? You can go to academic journals that would talk about uh, anything from online learning to open universities to flipped learning to blended learning, etc., etc. And uh, most universities would have uh, provided good infrastructure for ODL, for open and distance learning, especially the private ones, especially the big private universities. They would have good infrastructure within the school community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, the challenges is, number one, it is really open to abuse. Abuse of faculty, abuse of students, uh, even the abuse of uh, administrators in, ter in terms of equipment, resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there is also a weak information campaign because even though university would put forth, hey, we are 50% 50, 50 of our courses are blended. But how about the other 50%? And faculty members would always be resistant to change. Right? Is it the same? Especially faculty members who are young at heart. <laughs> Oh, I'm retiring next year. I don't want to go to training anymore. Uh, let the younger ones do it, etc., etc. So these are, you know, our continuous challenges and the acculturation. That technology is not the be-all and end-all of learning as well as OER. The presence of OER would not guarantee learning, right? But it will boil down into good instructional design, how you harness that power. Yeah. 
In terms of inclusive education, in universities, there are some infrastructures put in place, the elevator, the ramps. One university would have braille uh, at the, in front of the door of, of each of the room. So, so, and uh, some universities would take in, uh, say, for example, students with physical disabilities, okay? uh, deaf, the blind, etc., etc. Um, also, uh, there is a, a what do you call this a, a an in, academic environment of inclusivity in the Philippines. So we don't usually discriminate with with those with learning disabilities or people with disabilities in general. And also, we have a very very strong master's program and PhD program in special education. The PhD program in special education of the University of the Philippines is the first in Asia. So we have a very a, a supply support of faculty members. Oh, maybe they are graduating not enough numbers, but at least we have a you know a a continuous supply of those who would really take into consideration learning on how uh, inclusive education, uh, what special education is all about. Our challenges are students or parents would not declare disabilities. Right. Most university uh, in entrance exact in entrance application, they would have a box that uh, they have any disabilities, etc., etc. Except for the physical ones, because it is easily manifested. But for the you know other LDs like dyslexia, ADHD, um, Spurger, etc., etc., it is not usually declared because the parents. I understand the parents because the parents are so mothers children to be tagged as such. And we have also, although we have the Freedom of Information Bill in the Philippines, we also have the Privacy Act. So during our research, it was very, very hard to interview students. So when we, during that time, we interview students. During the interview, the parents are there, as well as a guidance counselor in order for us to be allowed to interview a particular student for research. There is no national policy yet in terms of special classes, whether, although the Philippine government in K-12 is moving towards inclusive classes. Before it was special education, so all the students with learning disabilities would be in a special class. Right now we are doing partial to full inclusion, which is a harder thing to do in my perspective because you would need specialized teachers. You would need shadow teachers inside the classroom, etc., etc. So I think another policy or another IRR should be done in terms of how do we implement it. Also, one limitation would be the number of classes in the Philippines. So ideally, According to research, it would be around 25 to 30 inside the classroom. But in the Philippines, we have 100. <laughs> but, well, in recent times, it's been improving. Now we have 50. But there was a time it was 70 to 100 in a class. And we have also multi-grade multi classes. Meaning to say, inside the classroom, there are two or three classes. Grade 1, 2, and 3. One teacher. Okay, just imagine. You know? So watch more if you're going to do an inclusion into these corresponding classes. And of course, uh, there is also limited use of assistive technology. I'm very, very happy to know that in Malaysia you have funding. The government will give you some funds to buy equipment for uh, students with learning disability can buy softwares or equipment or other resources. In the Philippines, we do have that, but in a very limited uh, supply. And also, the acculturation of inclusive education that I talk about. Also, in terms of UDL, in terms of Universal Design for Learning, uh, the tenets of UDL, according to realizing what to learn, how to learn, and why to learn, is 
in congruence with the framework of higher education institutions. I know that all educational institutions would be for inclusive education, uh, would be, uh, and also with the K-12 uh, education. Also, uh, we are doing a lot of training from the DepEd side, from the GED side, from the university side on how to improve pedagogy. And I think HEI, especially teacher education institution, could champion the use of UDM or vis a -vis inclusive open educational resources. In the Philippines, in, in our problem is that our educational system is continuously evolving. <laughs> another secretary, it would be another framework. Say, for example, in terms of HEI, before we are in, before we are in UBD, right? you know, UBD, and now we are in uh, ob, uh, uh, output based education, OBE, right? And then when we were talking with the, with the president, etc., Freddie, are you saying that we will be migrating to UDN? <laughs> so so it's, it's always changing. But, I, but the point is, if you're going to look at all these instructional models of all these curriculum models, they are one and the same. They, in essence, they are the same. Maybe the, maybe the assessment is different, the time frame is different, but in essence, they are. The same. Our challenges with UDL is training, policies and resources, resistance to change, and acculturation. During our research, we found out that teachers are actually using inclusive OER or, in, or the tenets of UDL. Only that they don't know it yet. If they're using, say, for example, closed caption, or they are mindful of the color blindness of the students, or arranging their students into, in terms of their vision, they are actually using UDL. They just don't know that this is UDL. So we really have to acculturate them. Okay. So with all those baseline assumptions and uh, we we had the same ones like you uh, we had the draft policy for the Philippines HDI so we did it in Sofitel in March 23 and 24 so we invited uh, we chose the the universities who are center of excellence in different fields. One would be in fishery, another one would be in agriculture, another one would be in education, ICT, etc. Et because our thinking is that uh, if they're going to create OER, it should be across majors. Okay? And we invited some of the big names also, <laughs> like, like you. So we have rep, uh, two UP chancellors. Luckily, they are my friends. <laughs> Because uh, it was a Saturday and Sunday, as just mentioned, and some of them are already booked on a conference abroad. And I told them, no, you cannot go. You have to come with me. <laughs> so these are our participants. And in terms of OER policy, as I've mentioned, we already have one in the Philippines, also sponsored by UNESCO. So it is spearheaded by Simeo with Ched and with, uh, they have it in September of 2015. So they, they have a corpus, they called upon HI also to review, to make a draft of what OER is, uh, what is an OER policy. And following that, they had again uh, representatives from them, NCHED, TESDA, and UPOU to finalize the joint Circular, and this is in 2016. So at least we have, you know, a policy draft that is done by HEIs and by uh, pertinent uh, organization and institution. However, <laughs> three years later, because they, they did the joint circular in 2016, they were not able to still um, 
finalize it. We don't have yet a copy of the OER circular. Okay. And uh, we, we decided to, to wait for it. Okay. Okay. So we have three workshops. One would be uh, discussing the basic tenets of UDL and blended learning and teaching practices using OER for UDL. And uh, we, I did the, the drafting policy for OER. For our UDL, it's the Dean of UP College of Education who, who did the workshop. And uh, for our OER, it is the Chancellor of UPOU, the highest uh, ranking uh, member of the UPOU. And I did the drafting policy. So these are some of our activities. So we also group them into smaller groups, group them in smaller groups. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we, they discuss how do, how do they harness the power of OER, UDL, OER and UDL inclusive in what the universities are doing. So as higher education institution, we have, I believe we have three functions, teaching, learning, and research. So how do you harness that that the power of inclusive OER into the things that we do. We could also have international internationalization, community development, etc. etc. Okay. So this is our synthesis. Number one, it is no longer a question whether we would promote OER or technology because of the type of learners that we have. Millennials of today are tech savvy, they are media savvy, right? And Generation C would have technology embedded in their genes. Maybe they would have a chip, right? So their lessons would be, and then <laughs> there's an OER. So it is no longer a question. The most pertinent question is how inclusive and uh, open that blend is in terms of OER. Also, diversity is a norm. Not only for our teach, not only for our students, but also for our teachers, right? So we really have to redesign our processes. We really have to design our practices and system in the HDI to accommodate different type of learners. Millennials of today, they don't want to enroll in a full-blown four-year course, right? Some of you are graduate of a different course, but you are now in teaching. Right? Do we call it a mismatch? Also, there should, we should ensure an institutional, multi-sectoral training. Not only in terms of the faculty who would be inside and in front of the classes, but the whole community, including the personnel, to, for providing a more inclusive environment. Also, I thought this is, there should be a holistic effort among different stakeholders. So from the onset, from the analysis, design, development, implementation, and assessment on inclusive OER, I am very, very joyful to see Dr. Sita and Dr. Abdullah in front. Because in our research, people with learning disability should be included in policy drafting. Because, uh, well, we don't have that in the Philippines. That's why when we presented it, some professors with, how come we are not included? You don't even know how we think or how we, how we learn, etc., etc. So I'm very, very, really, really good in seeing renowned professors with learning disabilities uh, involved in, in this project. And, our policy should be capacity building. It should be mindful of the language and cultural issues. I know you have 13 states of different issues. So it's also in the Philippines. We have around 100 languages. You can just imagine. And our grade one to three is multilingual, meaning to say they are taught in their local language. They would migrate to Filipino and English when it's grade four. So. This is also a big, big challenge for inclusive OER. And how do you sustain the project? How do you sustain it and providing a supportive environment? Yeah. Lastly, 
Okay, so it's the same here. Lastly, I want to stress out that we are making history as a group, right? So this is, when we talk of OER, we're talking of technology. And then vis-a-vis when we talk of inclusive education. But right now we're making history as a group to marry the two because this is the need of our times. And we could champion the use of promotion and practice of the use of inclusive error. So we should take this mission into heart. That we're not only doing this for this generation, for, but for the generation ahead. Because I think, God forbid, there would be more students with learning difficulties in the future, given the onslaught of what we have now. Right? And learning disabilities is not only physical. Language could be war. War could be war. Uh, sex, uh, gender could also be a learning disabilities in other countries, etc., etc. So after the workshop and the synthesis, we have the pledge of, of commitment. So this is a symbolic gesture that all our policy makers would champion the use of OER into their respective institutions. Again, for phase two, we would be talking about it, but what we envision for phase two is we would go into the island groups in the Philippines. We have 21 regions, we cannot do that, it's too big. So we would do the Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and Metro Manila. And we would train faculty, not only what is OER, but creating inclusive OER. So we want to come up with a portal, a national portal, for OER where all the HEIs in the country can contribute across majors, across different levels of education. Terima kasih, Malaysia.